Bruce Cooper. Welcome to the second episode of Highway 28, Diet Health and the Wisdom of Crowds. In the first episode, The Food Revolution, we learned from the diet doctor, Andreas Anfeld, that American dietary guidelines adhered to by most health and nutrition experts may be harmful to us and likely are the reason for increasing levels of obesity and diabetes in America. Dr. Onfeld explains how a low-carb, high-fat diet has helped his patients lose weight and control blood glucose levels. For more information, please check out his website, www.dietdoctor.com. In this Highway 28 episode, Diet Health and the Wisdom of Crowds, Tom Naughton explains how bad science led to possibly very misdirected dietary guidelines and why our government has not corrected the guidelines. As a result, many Americans instead are relying on the wisdom of crowds from blogs, videos, podcasts, films, and other sources on social media for better guidance. My thanks to Tom Naughton for permission to broadcast his presentation. So now let's move on to the video. And if you haven't seen this documentary, please watch it. Doesn't matter if you're a student, a physician, uh, if you're a politician, in, in fact, especially if you're a politician, you should watch this movie, please. So, uh, I think that you're just about to find out why I'm so excited and honored to welcome Mr. Tom Naughton to Springfield College. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. And I did used to be a stand-up comedian, and I can't do it like this, so that's more like it. How are you all? Good. I am uh, delighted to be here at lovely Springfield College in Massachusetts. I, I actually had a little misunderstanding uh, when this whole thing started. I went to Springfield College in Illinois. And about 10 years after I graduated, they invited me down to give a commencement address, so I did. And then a couple months ago, I get a letter from Dr. Wood inviting me to come out and give a presentation. I see Springfield College in the email address, and I thought, fabulous, it only took them 25 years to invite me back. <laughs> Apparently everyone who saw my first speech finally retired, I don't know. but. Uh, I am delighted to be here and I want to thank Dr. Wood for inviting me out to give tonight's presentation which we decided to call Diet, Health, and the Wisdom of Crowds. We decided to call it that because Dr. Wood told me we needed a pithy title for the postcards and uh, after I realized he wasn't lisping I agreed. <laughs> but if I were going to give this a longer title I would have called it something like this. Why people looking for diet and health advice are turning away from doctors, nutritionists, government agencies, medical trade organizations, and other established authorities and are instead getting their information from bloggers, podcasters, independent filmmakers, and countless other dedicated amateurs who communicate through social media. And you can see why we didn't want that on the postcard. But that is what I want to talk about tonight. Why are so many people who are looking for health advice turning away from the so-called experts and getting their health information from people like me or people like you? And to answer that question, I'm going to start with an old joke. Two drunks are in a bar and the bartender flips on the 6 o'clock news and the first thing they see is a man standing on the ledge of a 10-story building. So one drunk elbows the other and says, hey, I got 20 bucks as he jumps. And the other drunk says, okay, I got 20 bucks as he doesn't. Sure enough, boom, guy jumps. So the second drunk says, okay, I'm an honest man, here's your 20. The first drunk says, nah, I can't take your money. I've been drinking here all day. I seen him jump on the four o'clock news. I seen him jump on the five o'clock news. And the second drunk says, well, so did I, but I didn't think he'd do it again. <laughs> And that's the reason people are turning away from the experts, because for 30 some years now, they have been told to make the same bet over and over and over again, and they are tired of losing. And the bet they have been told to make looks like this. This is what we have all been told to do for the past 35 years or so. Does anybody think it's working? When you are at a shopping mall or an airport, do you look around and think, man, everybody looks so good these days? <laughs> no, of course not. 
Because the fact of the matter is, baby boomers and people my age and people younger are fatter and sicker on average than their parents and grandparents were at the same age. And that's a shame because back in the 60s, this is what the baby boomers looked like. And if you take away their wacky clothes and hairdos, that is what their parents looked like. And that is what their grandparents looked like. These people looked pretty good. And statistically, we know that type 2 diabetes was a lot less common then than it is now. So we have to think these people were doing something right. So, what were the official dietary guidelines they were all following back then? They weren't. What we had back then was the dietary version of a phenomenon described in a lovely book called The Wisdom of Crowds. Now, when I've mentioned the wisdom of crowds before, I've had people who have never read the book say to me, the wisdom of crowds, are you out of your mind? Don't you know mobs are dangerous? <laughs> Haven't you heard the masses are asses? Didn't you see the second season of American Idol? <laughs> and I say, yes, I understand that people can get together and vote and make a bad collective decision. That's what makes elections so entertaining. <laughs> but the wisdom of crowds is not about people voting on issues they don't understand. The wisdom of crowds simply means that knowledge is diffuse. It means you can name almost any subject and thousands, if not millions of people out there know something about it. And the wisdom of crowds also explains why little groups of experts, no matter how educated and how intelligent they are, almost never have as much accumulated wisdom and knowledge as we find out there in the crowd. So what was the wisdom of crowds about diet and nutrition back in these days? What did these people know? What did they tell each other? If you've seen Fathead, you know that Dr. Al Sears, who appeared in Fathead, told me if you had asked your grandmother back in the day, she would have told you that a diet based on bread and cereal and potatoes would make you fat. And my wife recently showed me a video of an old woman talking about cooking during the Depression. At one point, she actually said, for a while, all we could afford to eat in my family were potatoes, so we all started getting fat. There was a popular cookbook for diabetics back in that era. It told them the valuable foods were butter, cream, cheese, meat, poultry, fish, and eggs. And the forbidden foods were things like sugar, bread, cereal, and pasta. I recently saw an old episode of The Andy Griffith Show from 1964, and I found out the hard way I shouldn't try to put video in my PowerPoint presentations, so I'm just going to show you screen caps with the audio. But in this scene, Aunt B is trying to give them a piece of pie. Oh, Aunt B. No, ma'am. Just one more little bite of meatloaf here, and that'll kind of fill in the chinks. <laughs> Bonnie, you won't let me down. Oh, no, thanks. So I'm kind of watching the old carbohydrates and glucose this week. Apple pie is just loaded with carbohydrates. <laughs> there was a movie made in the 1970s I saw again recently, a comedy called Silver Streak. In one scene, a couple of fat guys who were played for laughs sit down to their diet meal, which looked like this. Hamburger patty, cottage cheese, and tomato slices. It's protein and fat, but no starch. And if you're my age or older, and almost nobody in this room is, but if you're my age or older, you would recognize that as the waste trimmer meal from your local diner. I went to high school in the 1970s. Our health teacher was also the wrestling coach, and I remember him telling us specifically, if you guys want to shed a few pounds, you need to stop drinking soda and cut back on the bread and the cereal and the potatoes. And what did he know? All he did was help hundreds of athletes get down to their competition weight without losing their strength. So, a little more meatloaf is okay, but you don't want to overdo the carbohydrates and the glucose. This is what people believed based on generations of experience. That was the wisdom of crowds back in the day when a lot more people looked like that. So, what happened? How did the wisdom of crowds get shoved aside and replaced by advice from the experts? And how did we all end up believing that foods created by Mother Nature will kill you? So the key to remaining lean and healthy is to eat processed foods created by modern industry. Before I get into specifically what happened, I want to briefly mention another book that pretty accurately predicts how and why this would all play out even though the book is more than 20 years old and it has nothing to do with nutrition policy. 
It was written by one of my favorite authors, a professor of economics named Thomas Sowell, and it's called The Vision of the Anointed. The vision of the anointed is almost the polar opposite of the wisdom of crowds, because the wisdom of crowds assumes that knowledge is diffuse and that knowledge is based largely on experience. It is unplanned because it's the result of spontaneous interactions. And in the wisdom of crowds, the answers kind of bubble up from the crowd because of these interactions. The vision of the anointed assumes that expertise is concentrated. Concentrated, of course, among the anointed. The anointed usually come from the intellectual class, and so their expertise is often purely academic or theoretical. The solutions the anointed give us are planned, and they are often posed. And because of that, they give us top-down solutions. So, to break it down a little farther, here's how Dr. Soule describes the vision of the anointed at work. First, the anointed identify a problem in society. To solve that problem, the anointed propose a grand plan. Now, Dr. Soule has nothing against intelligent people. He's an extremely intelligent man, but the people that he defines as a certain class of intellectuals have a tendency to fall in love with new ideas because they're new, or bold, or exciting, or exquisitely expressed. In other words, man, does that grand plan look good on paper. Because the anointed fall in love and become supremely confident with their own bold, new, exciting ideas, they often don't think they should be bothered by little hindrances like proof that their grand plan will work or evidence that the theory underlying it is actually valid. Because there's no time to lose, we must act now. Also, because the anointed are so in love with their own theories and ideas, they will, if they can, impose their grand plan on other people for their own good, of course. Now, they want to impose a plan on people, and yet there's no proof that it will work. How do they justify that? Here's how it works. The problem is the bad. So the anointed assume any solution they come up with must be the good. Therefore, if you oppose the grand plan, you're not opposing a plan. You are opposing the good that the plan would bring about, and therefore the anointed assume that anyone who opposes the grand plan must either be evil or stupid. And we don't have to listen to those people. Now, here's where it gets fun. Because of this, often dismissing evidence to the contrary, it sometimes turns out the grand plan didn't work. And it might even make things worse. If this happens, the anointed will never, ever, ever admit the grand plan was wrong. If the grand plan is wrong, it can only mean one of three things. The grand plan was good, but people didn't follow it correctly because they're stupid. Or the grand plan would have worked, but it was undermined by people who opposed it because they're evil. Or my favorite, the grand plan didn't go far enough. In other words, failure is held up as evidence that we need to do the same thing again, only bigger. <laughs> so with the vision of the anointed as our backdrop, let's look at how we ended up with the dietary policies we have today. In the 20th century, especially after World War II, there was a noticeable rise in heart disease among American men. So heart disease became a big concern. Then it became a huge concern when President Eisenhower had a heart attack. Now all of a sudden heart disease is considered a national emergency. Doctors are trying to figure out what causes it. Lo and behold, along comes a scientist named Ansel Keys who told us he had the answer. Keyes published a study in which he compared heart disease and fat consumption in a half dozen countries, and here's what he found. Well, there you go. Look at that trend line. It's unmistakable. The more fat, the more heart disease. We have found the answer. And because of that study, Keyes became known as the father of the lipid hypothesis, which I'm sure you're familiar with. It looks like this. At the time, this hypothesis was new. It was bold. It was exciting. It was exquisitely expressed. And the only problem is, it's wrong. What Keyes conducted here was an observational study. All he found was an association. And I know a lot of you take science courses, so you're probably familiar with this, but let's do a quick review. An observational study is a very weak form of evidence because an observational study is not a scientific experiment. It does not 
walk us all the way through the scientific method. If we want to go through the entire scientific method, we have to conduct a clinical study. Because in a clinical study, we randomize people into large groups, we balance all the variables, and then we change one variable to see what happens. One group goes on a diet, the other one doesn't. Or one group takes a drug, the other group takes a placebo. That's a clinical study. A clinical study is a scientific experiment, and for the most part, clinical studies are valid. In an observational study, all we're doing is observing people and gathering data. When we gather the data, we are looking for traits, behaviors, and results that seem to occur together. If they occur together, we would say they are statistically associated, otherwise known as correlated, otherwise known as linked. In other words, we can say we spotted a connection between A and B. And this will often be reported as A raises your risk of B. Sounds scary, doesn't it? Sort of like putting another bullet in the gun before you play Russian roulette? Well, here's something good scientists understand. Just because two traits are correlated, that does not mean one of them is causing the other one to happen. If we conducted a large observational study, I could demonstrate that losing your hair raises your risk of heart disease. Uh-oh, better do something about that. <laughs> Now, is there something about losing your hair that causes heart disease? Anybody think so? No, of course not. But they're correlated because men lose their hair as they get older and older men have more heart attacks. Age, in this case, is called a confounding variable and observational studies are full of confounding variables. There's a doctor and researcher who used to do work out of Harvard named John Yanidis. He has spent decades studying studies, going back and re-crunching the numbers. And according to Dr. Yanidis, 80% of the conclusions drawn from observational studies have ultimately turned out to be wrong. Now why would that be? Well, there are a lot of reasons, but one of them is that researchers have a tendency to spot the correlations they want to find and miss the ones they don't. Ansel Key spotted this correlation because it was the correlation he wanted to find. He already believed this. But in the same data that Keyes used, heart disease was also associated with sugar consumption. It was associated with owning a television. It was associated with owning a car. Keyes could have focused on any of these and focusing on sugar probably would have been, would have been a good idea. But he already decided fat was the problem. But wait, it gets worse. Keyes found this association within these six countries. But he actually had data for 22 countries. And if you put all 22 countries up on the chart, it would have looked something like this. So the lipid hypothesis began with data that was cherry-picked. Now, most scientists at the time thought Ansel Keys was kind of full of it. He really wasn't taken seriously for a while. But he had a very headstrong personality. And to make a long story short, he ended up on the board of the American Heart Association. And then the Heart Association, which had been dismissing the lipid hypothesis for years, suddenly adopted it. But even then, most doctors and researchers did not. And here's why. Over the next several years, there were several clinical studies, the kind that matter, to put that hypothesis to the test. So let's run few, through a few of the results. 1965 dietary trial published in the British journal The Lancet. The intervention group limited their intake of animal foods to three ounces of meat, one egg, and two ounces of skim milk per day. The control group stayed on their normal diet. The results years later, the intervention group did lower their cholesterol by 30 points, but there was no difference in heart attacks. Also in 1965, another British trial published in the British, British Medical Journal. This time, the uh, subjects were all men who had already suffered a heart attack, so excuse the cross-dressers there in our graphics. <laughs> they divided the men into three groups. One group switched to polyunsaturated corn oil. Second group switched to olive oil. Third group continued eating saturated animal fat. The results, years later, in the corn oil group, 52% were still alive. The olive oil groups, 57% were still alive. The animal fat group, 75% were still alive. 1969, the Minnesota coronary trial. This time the intervention group went on a low-fat diet with very little saturated fat and they added extra vegetables. Control group continued on their normal diet. The results years later, slightly more heart attacks in the intervention group. 
1973, the Sydney Diet Heart Study. The intervention group replaced animal fat with liquid vegetable oil. Control group continued consuming saturated animal fats. The results years later, there were more overall deaths, including deaths from heart disease in the intervention group. Now, I could go through more of these, but you get the idea. We have this hypothesis that is failing over and over in clinical research, and yet even today, most people think the lipid hypothesis is true and that it was backed up by tons and tons of research, which it wasn't. So by now, I hope you're asking yourself, how did this bold, new, exciting, but unproven hypothesis end up forming the basis of our dietary guidelines? What could possibly keep such a bad idea alive? In the 1970s, there was a special Senate committee whose mission was to deal with malnutrition. It was headed by Senator George McGovern. Not surprisingly for a government commission, they eventually decided to expand their mission. So it went from malnutrition to, what the heck, let's write new dietary guidelines for the entire country. And so they did. The McGovern Committee held hearings, they brought in some experts, they heard testimony, and then they wrote up new dietary guidelines for the entire country, which called for Americans to reduce their consumption of fat, switch from saturated fat to vegetable fat, reduce cholesterol to the equivalent of one egg per day, and then eat more carbohydrates, especially carbohydrates from grains. Now, if this is what they recommended, it must be what the scientists all told them, right? Well, I have news footage about the hearings in my film Fathead, so once again, just going to go with some screen caps and audio. But doctors took issue with that at the hearing, saying that eight studies involving 5,000 patients fail to show hard medical evidence that diet has anything to do with heart attacks. Hmm, let's listen to that part again. Eight studies involving 5,000 patients fail to show hard medical evidence that diet has anything to do with heart attacks. I just showed you some of those studies. Now, let's listen to this exchange between a research scientist and Senator McGovern. I have pleaded in my report and will plead again orally here for more research on the problem before we make announcements to the American public. Well, I, I would only argue that senators don't have the luxury that a research scientist does of waiting until every last shred of uh, evidence is in. We don't have time to wait for the evidence to come in. There were several eminent scientists who tried to tell the committee that there was no solid scientific foundation for what they were recommending. The head of the National Academy of Sciences, a man named Philip Handler, called the committee's recommendations nonsense and said that implementing them would amount to conducting a large, uncontrolled experiment on the American people. Now, thinking back to the vision of the anointed, how do you suppose the young, starry-eyed, intellectual vision of the anointed types on McGovern's staff dealt with those objections. They just decided these scientists had probably been paid off by the big bad meat and dairy industries. So they went ahead and released the guidelines. The USDA then picked those up and turned them into the food pyramid. Now, if the ball had stopped rolling here, if they just said, here's what we recommend and, you know, take it or leave it, maybe this wouldn't have been such a big deal. But they didn't stop there because, if possible, the anointed will impose the grand plan on other people for their own good, of course. So how did they impose it? Well, right away, researchers started learning that if they wanted to keep their federal funding, they had better produce research that backed up these guidelines. A doctor and researcher named George Mann, who called the lipid hypothesis the greatest scientific scam of this century, wrote in the New England Journal of Medicine that to be a dissenter is to be unfunded. Science journalist Gary Taubes wrote about this period, nutritionists knew if their research failed to support the government position on a particular subject, the funding would go instead to someone whose research did. So that was in the 70s and 80s. Then in the 1990s, the FDA got into the act. They required all food manufacturers to put a standardized nutrition label on their food products, and part of that label was this, telling people that on a 2,000 calorie a day diet, they should be getting at least 300 grams of carbohydrate, which translates to 60% of the calories, and it translates to a cup and a half of sugar. In other words, we are now telling the public, you know what, your grandma, 
your wrestling coach, Andy, Barney, and B. They didn't know what they were talking about. You really need to fill yourself up with glucose and carbohydrates. Now, we were free to ignore that advice, of course, but the USDA eventually required all government facilities, including elementary, middle, and high schools, to follow these guidelines. Which is why today you can no longer serve whole milk or even 2% milk in schools. Because, you know, when I was a kid in the 60s and all we drank was whole milk, we were also fat. But you can serve chocolate milk or strawberry milk if it's fat free. Never mind that it contains as much sugar as a can of Coca Cola. We have even had schools lately telling parents who send lunch from home that the lunch they pack at home must meet the USDA guidelines. I live in Tennessee. People in Washington are telling me what I can put in my kids' lunch. And a school in Chicago recently told parents, you know what, we're just not going to let you send lunch from home anymore because you're not doing it right. We want to force your kids to eat one of those nutritious USDA approved meals, something like this. This is a picture a grade schooler took of his USDA approved lunch. Now I could go on for hours about why this diet is a bad idea, but let me give you the very brief version. When you load yourself up with what Barney Fife would have called carbohydrates and glucose, especially refined carbohydrates like grains, you're going to jack up your blood sugar. Since high blood sugar is toxic, your body has to start pumping out insulin to bring the blood sugar down. But one of insulin's jobs is to tell your body to store fat. In fact, if your insulin is elevated, it becomes increasingly difficult to get the fatty acids out of your fat cells so you can burn them for energy. So if you are walking around with chronically elevated insulin, the insulin is telling your body to get fat and stay fat. And then high insulin and blood sugar together can trigger a whole cascade of negative effects that we now call metabolic syndrome. Which is why I don't think this is a coincidence. And I don't think it's a coincidence that rates of type 2 diabetes have been skyrocketing even among kids. Kids are getting type 2 diabetes now. That used to be called adult onset diabetes because people usually got it around middle age, if they got it at all. Now given how badly this advice has failed, the people promoting it, of course, threw up their hands, apologized, said sorry everyone, looks like we got it wrong, right? Of course not, because the anointed are never wrong. Instead, we have gotten explanations like this. The food pyramid has been described by many as difficult to understand, and as the obesity rates would suggest, has gone largely unheeded by many. In other words, the plan was good, but people didn't follow it because they're stupid. Apparently, people were out there trying to make little pyramids on their plates, I guess, and they couldn't get it right because they weren't good at geometry. So. What they've decided to do now is get rid of this hugely complicated triangle and repackage the same advice as a nice, simple circle. <laughs> now this advice will actually work. And when it doesn't work, which it won't, they'll probably try the food square <laughs> and maybe the food parallelogram. And Lord only knows what other shapes. But to be fair to the USDA, they are not repackaging exactly the same advice. Because in their latest edition of the Dietary Guidelines, they admit that obesity has gone up. And they said starting in 1980, what a coincidence. They admit that diabetes has gone up. So, they are now recommending that we cut the fat even more. In other words, we need to do the same thing again, only bigger. And once again, they are imposing this where they can. School lunches have been reduced in portion size and they now contain so little fat, kids are complaining that they are constantly hungry. You know what those kids are going to do when they get out of school? They're going to go to 7-Eleven and they're going to get a bag of chips and a soda. That's how we ended up where we are today. So, what's the good news? What do we do about it? When I was giving a speech a couple of years ago, someone asked me afterwards, well, how do we get the USDA and the American Heart Association and these other experts to change their minds? And my answer was, you won't. They are not going to admit they were wrong. Not in my lifetime. At least not until everyone who would take the blame is dead. Which is why the physicist Max Planck once said, 
<laughs> so my goal is not to get these organizations to change their mind. It's not going to happen. My goal is to convince people to stop listening to them. I will be happy when most people take the USDA guidelines about as seriously as they take this. <laughs> and I believe that's already happening and it's happening because of the wisdom of crowds is striking back. The question is, why now? This advice never worked. Why didn't people reject it 20 or 30 years ago? And to answer that question, let's go all the way back to, say, the 1980s and recount a bad experience that a lot of people shared. You go to a doctor and the doctor says, you're overweight and in danger of developing diabetes. You need to start following these guidelines put out by the American Diabetes Association. These guidelines will explain that carbohydrates drive up your blood sugar and therefore you should be basing your diet on them. Second checkup, your blood sugar's still too high and you've only lost three pounds. You really need to follow that diet. Third checkup, your blood sugar's getting even worse. Are you sure you're following that diet? Fourth checkup, well, you're clearly not doing well with the diet. This must be genetic. I'm writing you a prescription. Now, millions of people were probably having that same experience, but they wouldn't have known that. Because back in those days, you could really only share your personal experiences with family and friends, people you knew. And most of the advice that came down through the traditional media went through a small number of gatekeepers, and most of them were simply passing along the same old advice from the anointed. And I know, because I worked at a health magazine in the 80s, and this is exactly what we did. And I'm sorry to say, as I stand here now, I wrote articles 25, 30 years ago telling people to follow that same lousy advice. And I followed that same lousy advice, which is why I spent most of my adult life as a fat guy. What we had then was the information basically flowing in one direction. But that's all changed now thanks to the people who brought us the digital age and the people who invented the internet. Now when people become frustrated because they've been given advice that isn't working, they do what any intelligent human being ought to do. Go out on the internet and complain to several thousand perfect strangers. <laughs> And it's good that they're doing that. Because when people go out on the internet and they read forums and Facebook pages and blogs, they are seeing thousands of people expressing the same frustration in posts like these. It makes me so upset when I think of how I used to feed my daughter on the advice of her pediatrician and the government. Skim milk, cereal, pasta, bananas, orange juice. I was so frustrated because I couldn't figure out why she was so heavy. I was sent to a diabetes seminar by my doctor. I followed the diet, but my sugar was never under 170 to 180. When I went back and told the nurse, she said I didn't follow the diet correctly. Once again, sounds like this. I went low fat, 1,000 to 1,200 calories a day. I exercised religiously for an hour every single day. I did weight training. At the end of the first year, I'd gained 20 pounds, and it wasn't muscle. I've been trying to lose weight simply by eating less. I was extremely meticulous about it and only consumed 1,500 calories per day. Week one, I lost three pounds. Week two, I lost one pound. Week three, I lost zero pounds. I gained a pound back in the fourth week. When people go out on the internet and they begin to grasp how many people have been following the same advice that they have and are getting the same lousy results, they finally come to the logical conclusion. I'm not fat and sick because I have a genetic condition, and I'm not fat and sick because I'm stupid and lazy. I'm fat and sick because this advice is wrong. This advice doesn't work. And then they take that next logical step. Go looking for something that does work, something different. And it is that desire, the desire to finally find something that works, combined with the emergence of social media, that is bringing back the wisdom of crowds in a big way. Let's take another quick look what the wisdom of crowds is all about. It assumes that knowledge is diffuse. You know, I have a blog, right? I occasionally get some angry troll show up and say something like, why should anybody listen to you? You're not a doctor. You don't have a PhD. And I apologize for bringing this up at a college, but seriously, do we really think the only way to acquire knowledge is to sit in a classroom? As far as I'm concerned, that attitude's un-American because this guy didn't have a formal education, and this guy didn't have a formal education, and these two guys were college dropouts. 
The point is, there is a lot of knowledge out there in the crowd. And now with social media, it's easy for people to go find it. And that's what they're doing. They are finding it in forums. They are finding it in Facebook groups. They're finding it by listening to podcasts. They're finding it by watching YouTube videos. And of course, they're finding it in the gazillion and one blogs. There are paleo blogs, low carb blogs, blogs that analyze the science, blogs that feature interviews with doctors and researchers. There are blogs written by doctors and researchers. Now, do these people all agree with each other? Nope. There's a lot of disagreement and debate and discussion out there, but that's good. Because if you are trying to solve a problem, getting answers from a hundred different people is a way smarter strategy than listening to one expert who happens to be wrong. Which is why it drives me nuts when I see the USDA make statements like this. The dietary guidelines will help policymakers, educators, clinicians, and others speak with one voice on nutrition and health and reduce confusion caused by mixed messages in the media. They want people to listen to one voice. Is that really a good idea? What if the one voice is telling you to go on a diet that isn't going to work for you? It is much better for people to go out, learn about all these different diets, and then try one or two, or three, or four, until they find the one that works for them. And by the way, the one that works for them may not be the one that works for you, because we're all different. But the wisdom of crowds is based largely on experience, and the great thing with the rise of social media is now when people do find a diet that works for them, they can go out and share that experience with the rest of the world. I'll give you a few examples from my blog and other people's blogs. I use the approach of a protein vegetable diet. No fruit, no sugar, bread or rice. The result was triglycerides, which went from 666 to 140 in three and a half weeks. Also, fasting blood sugar went from 357 to 103. The chronic, painful digestive problems I was experiencing have almost completely subsided. I went to my doctor this morning who read me my blood work results. She was baffled by the improvements and blatantly asked me what the bleep I did differently this past month. What the bleep that person did was stop eating wheat. On March 27th, I began my new weight loss journey. I'm happy to report that by May 17, my blood sugar was down to normal. I was deemed no longer pre-diabetic, and my blood pressure was in the normal range. As of this writing, I have lost 68 pounds. I wanted you to know that I've lost 80 pounds, nearly 80 pounds since Fathead made me rethink everything I'd ever learned about food and nutrition. The reason people are turning to blogs and other forms of social media for health advice is that they are not getting results like these by listening to the anointed. They are getting these results by seeking out the wisdom of crowds, which once again was not planned, it was not imposed, it was not designed by a committee. This is just the result of people spontaneously sharing what they know with each other. And I'm not just talking about people like me who produce a film or have a blog. You know, it's all the people who participate in the process, and I hope someday you will all be part of this process. We have a Fathead book on Face Group now. We have 4,400 members now, and it grows by like 100 every three or four days. And it continually amazes me just how well-informed some of these people are. If a person comes to that group and they post a question, 20, 30, 40 people will jump in there with answers within like an hour. And a lot of the answers will actually include links to the relevant research. Here's what you need to go find out. So once again, because of all this interaction out there, the answers are bubbling up from the crowd. Now, do we still have this going on? Yes. But now there's a lot more of this going on. And more and more we are seeing this going on. Ideas are bubbling up from the social media to the traditional media. I'll give you a recent example. This is a blogger named Sam Feltham. For 21 days, he ate 5,700 calories per day of a very low carb, very high fat diet. He gained two and a half pounds, but he lost an inch around his waist. In other words, the little bit of weight he gained was muscle. So after a washout period, he repeated that experiment, this time 5,700 calories per day, same calorie load, this time it was a high carb diet. And this time he gained 16 pounds and put on four inches around his waist. Now, I thought that was a cool one man experience. What was really cool about it? The UK Daily Mail, one of the big papers over there, picked this story up and ran with it. 
and they actually asked the question in their article, is the standard ad uh, advice wrong? And they quoted a doctor saying, yes, the standard advice is wrong. And of course, they had to quote the British Dietetic Association saying, no, we're not wrong and we're not going to change our minds. And that's fine. I didn't think they would. Like I said, my goal is to get people to question what they have been told. And we're seeing more and more of that. A certified diabetes instructor wrote this article for Diabetes Health and she told diabetics that they need to be on a low-fat, high-carbohydrate diet. The reason? Because the USDA says so. After this article appeared, this site got absolutely slammed with comments like these. As a physician with prediabetes, I am appalled that a high carbohydrate diet continues to be promoted. I am 56 years old. For the past five years, I have maintained normal fasting blood sugars on a low carb diet. So you recommend that diabetics like me eat higher carb diets and then take as much medication as needed to keep blood sugar under control. How can that possibly make sense? I am a type 1 diabetic and I know for a fact what 45 to 65 percent of calories as carbs can do to my blood sugar. This is absurd and borderline dangerous. A whole bunch of people on Facebook later were complaining that they left similar comments which never got published. And Diabetes Health uh, said they were having technical difficulties. <laughs> as in, technically, we don't like it when our expert gets slammed in public like this. But that's what I think the difference is. I think 20 years ago, most people would have read this article in a magazine and thought, well, this must be good advice. She's an expert. It's in a magazine. But now with social media and all this interaction and back and forth, I think more people are starting to look at the so-called experts with a very healthy dose of skepticism. And I'm even seeing more of something I call peer review by social media. People outside the research establishment are now enthusiastically pointing out what's wrong with some of the studies out there, especially the observational studies. And I know the researchers, at least some of them, are paying attention. Because a couple years ago, I wrote a, a post critiquing this stupid study that pronounced that eggs raise your risk of diabetes. And I wondered, for example, well, if eggs cause diabetes, then why was diabetes, the red line, going up while egg consumption was going down? The researcher who produced this study actually felt compelled to reply. And his reply basically boiled down to, I'm a scientist and you're not, so shut up. <laughs> they don't like it when the common people question them. They would like us to shut up. In fact, they tried to make one of us shut up. This is a blogger named Steve Cooksey. He is a diabetic. He lost a lot of weight and got his blood sugar down to normal, basically by going back to this. And now he coaches other diabetics on how to do the same thing. So registered dietitians in North Carolina got together and tried to bring him up on charges because he's giving out health advice and he doesn't have credentials. I mean, this guy has helped hundreds of people. They wanted him to take down his blog because he doesn't have credentials. You're not one of the anointed, so shut up. Well, I have news for them. That isn't going to happen. We're not going to shut up. The genie's not going to go back into the bottle and the anointed are not going to regain control of this conversation because the wisdom of crowds isn't going away, social media isn't going away, people aren't going to stop helping each other. Let me give you one more example of why they won't. This was a post on the Fathead Facebook group, a woman explaining how for so much of her life she was fat, she was frustrated, she was following the expert advice, going on the low-fat diets, she'd lose a little weight, then she'd have to quit because she felt depressed and miserable, which is not surprising. A lot of people feel depressed and miserable on low-fat diets. So here's the rest of her story. By last Thanksgiving, I had gained all the weight back except 10 pounds. I was hungry all the time, but I knew I could never go back to living the way I did to lose the weight. I turned to my husband one day in tears and asked him if he would still love me if I was fat for the rest of my life. I just couldn't do it again. I was going to try one last time, and if that didn't work, I was resigned to giving up entirely and living the rest of my life as a fat woman. Bless Bill. He hugged me and assured me he would always love me. Good man, Bill. So I started searching online for ideas. 
At that point, a perfect storm of coincidences happened. We were led to the oiling of America, which led to tons of documentaries on health and, and nutrition, which led to Fathead. My searches had already started me to watch my carbs, but Fathead put it all in place, that light bulb moment. In the past year, I've now lost almost 65 pounds, almost 75 pounds from when I first lost weight in 2005. This Thanksgiving, I am thankful for all the people, scientists, doctors, bloggers, everyday people, who never gave up on getting the message out to people like me who were utterly despondent and desperate. If it weren't for this information, I would be a fat, unhealthy, unhappy mess. There are millions of people out there now like her. People who went out into that crowd and they found those answers they so desperately needed. Those people are never gonna listen to the anointed again. They are never going to go back to placing the same losing bet over and over and over again, not even if you get them drunk. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed and will benefit from this episode of Highway 28. My thanks to the RCTV staff for their help. Also again, my thanks to Tom Naughton for granting permission to broadcast his presentation. Tom Naughton is a very active blogger and can be found at his website, www.fathead-movie.com. Until next time, I'm Bruce Cooper.